So, what I want. Okay, so what is the basic problem that we want to solve? Um, hmm, would be wrong. There we go. So we want to sample an image from text, but we want to we want to ask how do we learn this probability distribution of an image conditioned on text and then efficiently sample from it. So in particular, the idea is to use some training set where we have a pairs. We have images and text together. So that is, I have some image of cats or whatever I have pictures of. I have some piece of text that describes the image, and I have these pairs. And what I want to do is to optimize some fiducial probability distribution uh, P, P of theta over theta so that it approximates the true distribution over images conditioned on text P. And what we want to do is to parameterize this distribution so that it's efficient to, to, to sample from it. Sorry, so we have a we have a set mm -hmm. of distributions P of theta and like to figure out what the weights are on the data. So what the it, that's exactly right. Let me see if I can find my, uh, well, that's fine. I'll, I'll just be pushing on this for now. Yeah, so the question that we're going to be interested in is slightly simpler. We're going to forget about the text. We're just going to assume that I want to sample from the space of natural images. So if there's no text, I just want to be able to put in some random numbers, uh, or, or and I want to produce something from the space of natural images. So indeed, we have uh, I have some data set which is going to encode some empirical distribution over the space of images, and I want to train some model P sub theta where I optimize over theta so that when I sample from P sub theta, it is as if I am sampling from some true distribution over images. So the first tool that we're going to employ uh, is um, the distinction between Fokker-Planck equations and Langevin dynamics. So this is actually one of the central tools in getting these models to allow you to efficiently sample from the space of images. So we're going to build up to this in steps. So let's start with the heat equation, something that we all know and love, especially in this room, which is related to Brownian motion. So the heat equation, of course, is a partial differential equation, whereas Brownian motion is a, a stochastic ODE. It describes the stochastic evolution of a particular point in Rn. So the relation between these two as far as we're concerned, is going to be given by the answer to the following question. If I have some initial probability distribution P sub naught of x, how do we sample from uh, the, the heat flow version of the distribution P sub t of x at time t? So how do we do that? Well, there are two ways of doing it. The first way to do it is that we can, um, we can take the initial distribution, we can evolve it under the heat flow, and then we can sample from the distribution at time t. That's one way of solving the problem. But the equivalent way of solving the problem would be to sample from the distribution at some initial time, and then to evolve that sample using Brownian motion. And then in distribution, what you'll get at the end of that procedure is going to be something which is which commutes with the other way, our other procedure in the diagram. But if you think about it, it's much it, it's a much better idea in practice to use this alternative route, because in the first one, you have to evolve an entire PDE uh, for an amount of time t. Whereas in this other procedure, you just have to sample from your initial distribution and then evolve a single point stochastically in order to get uh, the, uh, the, the sample of time t. So it's much more algorithmically efficient to do, for example, on a computer. Now, there's a generalization of this idea to a more general set of equations, namely the Fokker-Planck equations. So the Fokker-Planck equations, there's this function v of x. And if I replace v of x with 0, then we recover the case of the heat equation. And then the stochastic Langevin equation also has this V appearing in it. So, and, uh, and again, this is a PDE and this is a stochastic ODE. And the question is, given some P naught of X, how do we sample from PT of X? We can ask the same question that we asked of the heat equation. And indeed, it, it's designed to have the same answer, where the Fokker-Planck equation bears the same relationship with stochastic Langevin. But if we want to, if we want to sample from time T Fokker-Planck, we can sample from the initial distribution, evolve according to the appropriate stochastic Langevin, then we get the, the, the suitable sample in distribution. Great. So let's try to understand this equation slightly better, or a key feature of it. What is its long time dynamics? What happens if we evolve it for a very large amount of time? Well, to look at its steady state, we can set the left hand side equal to zero. This is what happens when, uh, when the time derivative vanishes, that's when it reaches the steady state. And if you solve this, you find the infinite time version of the Fokker Planck equation is just p of t of infinity of x is some normalization times e to the minus v of x, where v of x is the same function which is appearing there. 
So this tells us that if we evolve our thing for long enough, then we're going to end up land on a distribution which is uh, which goes like e to the minus v of x. And indeed, to calibrate your understanding against the heat equation, the heat equation has v of x equals zero. And as such, you would expect to, on a compact domain to have a uniform distribution, which is exactly what would be suggested because it would be some constant times e to the zero, which is indeed uniform. So, so this comports with our intuition. But now what's interesting about this is suppose that v of x is some function of your choice. Suppose your desire is to sample from this distribution. Well, something you could do is you could start with a Gaussian distribution, which you do know how to sample from. There are efficient algorithms to do this. You could then sample from it, evolve it by the stochastic Langevin equation. If you evolve it for long enough, you'll approximately get a sample from the infinite time distribution, which is the same as, uh, as, as sampling from this. So that is, if you want to sample from, uh, if you know have a particular v of x in mind, this gives you an efficient algorithm for sampling uh, from, from that distribution. So the, so the way that this is leveraged, I want to, I'm going to say the same words, but in slightly different notation uh, that are, is going to make it more compact and useful to generalize. There's an idea called score-based sampling, which is as follows. Suppose that we now have some parameterized distribution, p sub theta of x, where now we have some v, which is parameterized by some things. These are parameters that we may optimize or do something with. And then there's also some normalization so that this is, renders it into a probability distribution. So I'm going to define the score by the gradient of the log of the distribution, which is identical with minus the gradient of this v sub theta term in the exponential. So now I can write down, so this quantity is independent of the normalization. That's a nice feature, but it only depends on the object in the exponential. And we can write down the Fokker-Planck equation uh, corresponding to such a v, and then the stochastic Langevin equation, and observe that they only depend on the probability distribution through the score. So which is to say that this is a Fokker-Planck equation, the stochastic Langevin equation, whose long time dynamics will allow us to sample from p sub theta of x. But I want to notice that the only data of p sub theta of x that enters into the Fokker-Planck equation, the stochastic Langevin equation, is this function s sub theta of x. That's the only way in which it depends on the distribution that we want to sample from. So, then uh, what we can do is that if we have, for example, so start with some Gaussian distribution, and we want to sample from p sub theta of x of long times, uh, then we only, we, we, can, we only require the score as part of our data of the system to be able to do this successfully. So this is called score-based sampling. This is the basic idea. One reason why it's useful, by the way, is that in more naive formulations of sampling, I mean, if you did it very naively, you might be forced to estimate z of theta, what the normalization is of your probability distribution. That can be very costly. It can be complicated to do. But what's nice is that if you only know the gradient of the term inside the exponential, then that suffices for purposes of being able to do efficient sampling. So now we can put those ingredients together, and I can tell you how these latent diffusion models work, these models that allow you to sample these nice images. And then, well, related to physics and bit. So this is a relatively recent subject. It was developed in uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021, actually by some uh, ex-physicists. Um, and let me give you the basic set of ideas. Let's consider the following flows. These are Ornstein, Ullenbeck uh, uh, flows, um, which allow you to sample at late times from a Gaussian distribution. So the, the idea of a score-based diffusion model, so this at infinite times, allows you to sample from just a standardly normalized Gaussian. So suppose that we have some initial distribution, which is the distribution over images that we wish to learn. So I'm going to call this P star. The star means it's the, the empirical distribution over images that we glean by looking at images in the world. I give you some data set. It, it, there's a, an empirical distribution over images implied by that data set. And that's what P sub star of X is going to, is going to consist of. So we want to learn some approximation to that distribution. So the idea then is that we can, we're going to, uh, we're going to flow this distribution at time zero by an amount of time t according to the Ornstein-Ullenbeck process. And we're going to then try to learn the score by optimizing a parameterized score over theta. Okay, so, so that's quick. Let me unpack what the, what the idea is. We have this distribution over the space of images. And what we're going to do is we're going to flow it so that the, all of the images are going to become Gaussian random uh, 
Gaussian random distributions. So, so I have a nice image. I, I can sample a nice image from a cat, and then I'm going to noise it using an ornstein uhlenbeck process until I just get Gaussian noise. What I'm going to try to do then is have an algorithm which allows me to learn how the score of the function I want to learn um, changes as I go from the distribution over images into this noisy distribution over Gaussians. And then, having done so, I'm then going to use that score to construct a reverse flow that's allow me, going to allow me to go from the space of Gaussian noise back to the space of images. So let me draw a cartoon to sort of show you what's going on. I think this is more illuminating. So, so suppose that I have a picture of, of a cat. Um, this is just a stock image of a cat. I do not, physicists are not allowed to own cats for various reasons. Um, <laughs> if, we, if we take, uh, if we take the, the cat and we flow the cat by noising it according to an ornstein uhlenbeck process, we arrive at some Gaussian distributed disk with the animals. That's right. Well, this is this is merely a representation of the animal as opposed to uh, the animal itself. But anyway, the um, so what we can do is we can use this to empirically look at the flow of the score corresponding to the actual distribution over the space of cat images, for example. And we can try, and what we're going to try to do is to learn how the score over the empirical distribution changes as we flow it into the noisy images. And then, so we're going to learn, we're going to learn some, uh, I'll use my judicious use of the whiteboard here. We're gonna learn some S sub T of theta of X, which is an approximation to the score of the distribution over images as it's flowing. And then we're going to use that to construct a reverse flow, where we're going to use this thing that we learn to start now with, if I sample Gaussian noise, I will use the reverse flow to then try to sample from the true distribution, namely to produce an image of a cat. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, you call the score for some reason. It's actually the velocity field, right, of the potential that you consider minus potential. Yes. So what, why it's called score? I mean, uh, oh, oh, the, 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 the gradient, well, the gradient of the, yes, it's the velocity it's field. The velocity field. This so is just the, the, the parlance of um, the machine learning field. It's the last well, the, There should be some intuition behind it. So uh, that's why I'm asking. Sure. Well, another way of saying it, the sort of physics perspective is that uh, if it's the, um, it's also the gradient. Okay. So in statistical physics, V is sort of like the Hamiltonian. It's like if you're sampling from a, a thermal state, you sample from something that's like e to the minus uh, energy over temperature. And this is, this is like a gradient of an energy uh, in, in the statistical theory. So you're essentially, uh, you know, you can, as you're sort of moving down the flow, you're sort of minimizing some energy uh, that corresponds to your, uh, the, I mean, I don't know if this, this at all is helpful. These are just words, but um, I, I, should, I should mention also, I mean, my collaborator, uh, Simone, is, is a mathematician. I'm a physicist, so I, I think, you know, I, I have certain license in saying ridiculous words that don't mean anything. That's sort of professional. <laughs> 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 but insofar as they inspire the right ideas, then maybe it's okay. Um, right. In any case, um, so there's one other ingredient, which is how to learn a score. So actually, I don't know the origins of why they call it a score. I, I, uh, I think that, well, I have a guess, which I'll tell you in a moment. Um, you see, uh, if you do a lot of machine learning, or if you're such a person, you do a lot of optimization. And uh, usually you want to like maximize some object, or you want to minimize some object. And if you're going to maximize something, you may as well call it a score, because uh, it seems like you're winning. Um, so you might want to maximize some object, including the score. That would be my, my guess. But Maybe maybe someone knows. Uh, yes. No, no, but this is, a, this is, of course, in the vector field. But, uh... Not a quantity. It's not a. It's not your test result. It's it's telling you which way to go uphill to get to the better score. Yeah, that's that's right. Um, anyway, yeah. anyway, no, it is a vector field. Uh, yes, indeed. So, what is the thing that we want to minimize involving the score? Well, it turns out that there's a nice quantity to minimize, which is a, a so-called Fisher divergence. So you take your distribution of over images of time t. And you have some true score, and you have some fiducial score, which depends on theta. And you want to minimize just the Euclidean uh, distance or the, 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 the L2, the little L2 norm of these things 
uh, with respect to, to P. So if you can minimize this over theta, you can guarantee that S sub T of theta will be S sub T star under suitable conditions. So you're staying the game What's that? State it in data set. Uh, yes, I'll, th that's right. It, it comes from the data set. I'll, I'll say more precisely in a moment. But for the moment, I'm sort of assuming that there is some sort of uh, kind of platonic true distribution over the space of images, whereas really it's derived empirically with samples. But I'll make the, I'll make the jump from the empirical distribution to the platonic distribution. I'm here platonic, and then I'm going to jump to empirical in a moment. So in one slide. The star is the platonic? Yeah, star is the platonic. Yeah. So the nice thing about this quantity is that by using, by integrating by parts, um, what, we, what you find is that you can, by integrating by parts and dropping a constant, the constant doesn't depend on the parameters theta, so it's, it's unnecessary for purposes of optimization. We end up seeing that the quantity that we want to minimize um, actually uh, is, is a relatively simple uh, function of the score vector field. It's you sample points X from your distribution flow to time T, and then you look at this particular uh, combination of the score, you basically look at its divergence plus its norm with some factor of two, and then minimizing this is equivalent to minimizing this. That's very nice because notice that sampling from this distribution um, it, uh, if, if we ourselves could sample, uh, have this distribution, okay, well, this distribution we can sample from using our empirical data, because we take some images and we noise them, and that's like sampling. And this is something that we've parameterized. So this is, this is a very natural object to attempt to minimize in some optimization protocol. So to put everything all together, so we minimize this over theta, what we do is that we sample n times from the space of images. So this is now the kind of empirical version of the story. We have n different images. And we also sample n times t from the uniform distribution on 0 to t. And we take the uh, cave image and we flow it under an ornstein uhlenbeck process by, by amount t sub k. So these are like the different degrees of smearing of the different images. So we have n images, which are each flowed or, or Gaussianized by different amounts. And then what we do is that we, we, we take these quantities and we stick them into some empirical version of a loss function. This is the, the empirical version of what I showed you on the last slide. This is the, uh, the, the non-platonic version. And you minimize this over theta. And then you can then use the learned score field to approximately sample from P star of X by constructing a flow which exploits. So this literally is the score-based diffusion model algorithm. And this now is is, is, is exploited all over the place and used whenever you uh, look at generative image models in the context of machine learning. This is essentially the algorithm with some extra bells and whistles. And so we've sampled n times from P star, and then we use it to sample from P star. Uh, so you sample n times from P star, and then what you can do is uh, you, then the procedure is that, so the way you would use it is that you would generate uh, Gaussian noise and then you would try to flow that backwards into the space of images. And what's sort of interesting is that if you have n be large enough, and it sort of depends on various details of what you're sampling, you can end up finding images that were that are nothing like the ones, or well, that are obviously something, but you, you don't always recover your original images. So for example, the image that I showed you of myself giving some talk in Toronto, clearly that was not in their data set, but what's sort of miraculous, which we don't actually have a good understanding of, is that somehow if you do this with a number of images that's large enough, you end up being able to produce something that looks like from the natural space of images, whatever that means, uh, that is not in your data set. So um, we just sample from the star by, uh, by using our data set. This is called sample. Not by, us well, by using the data set in a very indirect way. The data set allows you to learn a flow from a Gaussian distribution to a sort of approximation of some fiducial platonic distribution over the space of images. But in order to do that, you need to do step one. The Correct. Total sampling data set. That, that's right. But the idea somehow is that this, that if you have n distinct images, that somehow if you can generalize appropriately, the number of images that you can then get by sampling at the end is sort of much vastly larger than n and is somehow richer in some qualitative way. Okay, so that's the basic picture 
of, of where these pictures come from and more efficient than that sampling a vast number of points from the data set instead of one. Yes. Yeah. Empirical. Empirical. I, mean, there, I mean, there's not a great theoretical understanding. Okay. So, so that's, so that's some state of the art ideas and, and kind of intersection of machine learning and physics. Um, but now I want to turn over into talking about a physics topic that goes back 50 years called the renormalization group. And I'm going to show you how the subject in the, of the renormalization group that we use all the time in physics connects to various subjects in stochastic longitudinal dynamics and optimal transport. Uh, that, that, that it's, it's, a, it's a topic that's sort of very well centered in mathematics. And it's going to end up um, having really interesting relations with the first part of the talk, which I'll explain later on. But for the moment, we can bracket off the first part of the talk. That's just how your GPT algorithm works when you do DALI, when you sample images. So bracket that off, and we'll return to that later. So what is the renormalization group? So let me say some, uh, some physics words about it. So here's the question which it attempts to answer. How does our effective description of the physical system change as we tune the precision, precision of our measurement algorithm? So what does that mean? Well, let me give you a kind of intuitive example. I'll give you two intuitive examples that are a little bit, uh, uh, they're a bit far-fetched, but they give you this essential point. Suppose that I wanted to, uh, to study uh, a, a glass of water. Well, one thing I might do is that I might write down the Schrodinger equation for a bazillion H2O molecules, some enormous number of H2O molecules. Now, that would be completely impractical to describe it that way. So you might say, well, you should use you know, the Navier-Stokes equations or, 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 or some other PDE. That would be a much better way than writing down the Schrodinger equation for just an enormous number of interacting particles. But intuitively, we might think that the predictions of the Schrodinger equation with uh, a lot of interacting h molecules and the Navier-Stokes equations in, in appropriate regime should agree with one another. But if I can't measure my fluid at distance scales, which are uh, if I can only measure it at distance scales, which are much larger than the atomic scale, then the predictions between these two ways of writing down the system should agree with one another. Another example in the context of mathematical physics is suppose that you uh, have a gas of hard spheres that are bouncing in a box, and you might imagine that they should be described if you can't resolve the individual spheres by some kind of Boltzmann equation, by some kind of PD. Um, so in that case, you can say, well, if I can't resolve the individual balls that are bouncing around, then it should furnish some kind of PE description if I can only measure the coarser level. So it, it turns out that all of high energy physics and all of statistical physics is predicated on uh, a set of techniques that allows you to take a certain description of the system at short distances, allowing you to resolve the fine details, and flowing, in a certain sense, the equations such that it gives you a description of the system at a coarser distance scale. So we don't actually know how to do it in the two cases that I just mentioned to you of, uh, of, of a gas of hard spheres or of, you know, of H2O molecules going to Navier-Stokes, but we do know how to do it in other cases in which there's a similar kind of logic in the standard model of particle physics. So um, it's, uh, it's the case that if you have fundamental particles, but you can't observe them, what is your best description of a system which describes it at the level of resolution at which you can measure? So this is uh, called the renormalization group for sort of slightly abstruse historical reasons. It is not a group, um, nor uh, it's really at best a semi-group. The reason it's like a semi-group is that if you flow your description of the set of equations as you coarse grain, you can't go backwards. In other words, you can go from the Schrodinger equation of H2O molecules to Navier-Stokes, but you can't go from Navier-Stokes back to the Schrodinger equation. So it's, 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 a, it's a unidirectional thing. So RG, as I said, that's the, that's the abbreviation of the normalization group, is one of the central engines uh, of quantum field theory and statistical field theory. And uh, a question is, how do we efficiently compute RG flows numerically? If I give you a description of the system, how do I figure out what its kind of an optimal or a, a convenient description of the system should be if I can only measure it at coarser scales? That's, that's the kind of question we want to know. So, um, okay, so let me just make one observation just at the moment, just as, as a brief aside, how this might connect with something you've seen so far, at least in some abstract way. Well, 
suppose that I have a bunch of images of cats. This is sort of silly, but it actually will have a precise connection later. Um, the space of cats, if I can only look at, a, uh, 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 at images of cats uh, through a very blurred uh, lens, then maybe they look sort of indistinguishable from if I look at Gaussian noise uh, fr from uh, through a blurred lens. So you might imagine that there's a sense in which these kinds of stochastic Langevin dynamics that take us from cats to Gaussian noise might at least bear some analogy in some way with these renormalization group flows. And in fact, what I'm going to show you in an interesting way is that that can be made completely precise in a certain context. So let me give you the basic setup. So let me give you the simplest example of a statistical field theory that we use in physics. Um, so let's suppose that we consider RD and we consider a, a, a scalar function which maps us from RD to R. So just a scalar map. Now, what we're going to consider is a probability functional, uh, which is a... Uh, uh, which is a distribution over the space of scalar fields. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll say more precisely what I mean by this in a moment. Um, the, the, the one that's really well defined is the Gaussian random field. Uh, but this is a Gaussian distribution. You can make this precise. So let, let me show you what I have in mind. If this is some uh, positive definite differential operator, this is the, the, these leading terms, for example, would say that this is a form of, uh, this is some kind of, uh, uh, Gaussian random field, but more generally, you can consider higher order terms that are non-quadratic in the fields, and you could try to study those as well. And these are important in statistical physics and the study of magnets and fluids and various other things. So notice here that there's a parameter lambda, which is going, which I'm going to call our RG scale. So yeah, operator there, am I supposed to think of this being like a Laplacian or what? Uh, sorry. Yeah, let's say it's a Laplacian precisely. In the simplest case, we're going to consider something slightly more general, but Laplacian is a good is the right model to have in your head. Laplacian plus constant. So we're going to have a parameter called the RG scale, which is going to be the largest frequency that we can probe using our measurement apparatus. So we're saying that we can't look at the system at arbitrarily high frequencies. There's a cutoff in the frequencies that we can effectively measure. Or because of the relation between frequencies and real space, it means that there's a shortest distance scale L, which we can observe, and they're related reciprocally. So the exact normalization group flow equation, or an example of what these things are called, is that we would like, for example, to understand as we tune our, is, is there a flow on these distributions that allows us to allow them to change as a function of our cutoff scale? In other words, as we can only observe progressively lower and lower and lower frequencies, or that is make observations of the system at coarser and coarser, longer and longer and longer distances, how does our description, how can, how can we allow our descript description of the probability distribution to change so that it doesn't mess up all of the observables that we can still measure? So that it, it preserves all the long distance physics, but maybe doesn't preserve the short distance physics. So the general form of these equations, I'll give you some precise examples, has the following form. You, it's a differential equation where you ask how the probability that the functional changes as you change the scale lambda. And the right-hand side is going to be some depend on some functional derivatives of the, of the distribution. So this idea goes back to Ken Wilson, who won the Nobel Prize, uh, basically, for the discovery of how to use these phenomena to understand critical systems. Uh, and it's, there's a beautiful review with Koket that he wrote in 74, which explains the panorama of these ideas. And then Joe Polchinski, uh, famous high energy theorist who in fact unfortunately passed away a few years ago, um, had a very beautiful articulation of it that I'm going to tell you now. Uh, sorry, in this equation, uh, you know, you know, schematically, yes. lambda is close to zero or to infinity here. What, I mean, uh, ah, what... um, lambda is going to be, uh, right. So let me give you an example. So it, it depends. So suppose, for example, that uh, you can't resolve the, uh, well, okay. lambda is at the shortest distance, is, is the largest frequency that you can measure. So, so the it length, started infinity, so we'll say. It starts at infinity, or, or at least very, very large, mm -hmm. you know, some large number. And then it goes down to some value that is physically significant. For technical reasons, you don't want to always make it go to infinity. I mean, just want to be very large. Because when it's infinite, yeah, then yeah. you can run into problems. Mm -hmm. So let me give you Polchinski's basic idea. 
Let's consider an object, which is uh, a moment generating function. So suppose that we have, you don't have to worry about the particular form of this. I'm writing this in Fourier space. If it's not familiar to you, don't worry so much about the structure of it. But the idea is that I'm writing here a generating function, which if I take derivatives of the log with respect to, ah, sorry, this type of these should be j's, not phi's. If I take derivatives of the log with respect to, to this source j, then it'll generate correlation functions of the theory at different momentum scales. So again, these should be j's, my apologies, not phi's. So this is an object, again, it's, a, it's like a moment generating function, and th this encodes the data of the theory. So wh what I've done is that I've, I've organized the, the, the partition function into, into three pieces. One is the quadratic contributions to the theory. So this is like the Laplacian term that you were asking about. This is a constant. Uh, this is the term with the source. And then there's possibly interaction terms that depend uh, on higher powers of phi. Sorry, and should it be phi and minus the i on the right hand side there? Uh, so j seems to double phi, j of p seems to double phi and minus p. So. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. It should, it should be j and minus p. That's right. Thank you. So you said, so, uh, you said this is a Fourier space. Yes. So is it by j? Because it's by uh, you seem to have oh. made a differentiation into a phi, right? So it's kind of like you took a Fourier transform. Yes. Yeah, so the there, there, there's a, a notation that physicists use, which may be unfortunate, which is that if you really change the label, you, we don't always put a check on. Okay. But, <laughs> and what J has no relation to phi J, but to phi half. No. 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 Okay. It's part of the operator, but it's that's just a couple of buses. Just a couple. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a function. It's a function of theta. So. There's also going to be an object that Polchinski puts in, he calls k sub lambda of p squared. And this is going to be a function which is equal to one um, up until uh, um, basically p squared equals lambda. So in other words, it cuts off, it cuts off the frequencies when, 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 they're, when they're larger than the cutoff frequency. So what this does effectively by putting in the quadratic term is that if you compute perturbation theory, like if you if you expand the rest of it in terms of a polynomial by bringing it downstairs outside of the exponential, it's going to suppress all of the contributions which are above the frequency lambda. Um, okay, so the other thing that Bolchinsky does is it suppose that we only want to probe correlation functions where all of these p's are less than the cutoff frequency. And we can do that by making the sources fall off above the cutoff frequency. So Polchinski's observation is that what it means to capture the same physics below the cutoff scale is that the moment generating function, when you, when you change it in lambda, only changes multiplicatively by a constant. And indeed, because the relation between correlation functions, again, these are J derivatives, um, is, is related to the logarithm, changing it multiplicatively by a constant will, will not affect this relation. So this is what Polchinski says we need if it's, it is to be a good renormalization curve flow. And then he asks the following. Uh, uh, he asks the following question. Okay, so so this so this is just writing it out more explicitly. He asks the question, a Jeopardy question: Is there a functional differential equation that the interaction term should satisfy so that this relation holds? So, in other words, what he's asking is: We have these interaction terms in our in, in our uh, in in the moment generating function. If we want this to be true. How must these behave? And he onzotzes an answer, which is the answer that he finds. He finds that if the interaction terms satisfy this functional differential equation, then the start equation is satisfied. So in other words, he finds a kind of, uh, kind of local rule, uh, or, or rather this nice functional differential equation for which the interaction terms flow such that the condition that all of the observables below frequency lambda are preserved uh, obtains. So let me write this for you in a way that might seem slightly more familiar. So I can rewrite this in a slightly different notation, which will make me make it seem more clear. Maybe I'll change the notation slightly. That if you write this at the level of the probability distribution, what Polchinski discovered is that a particular class of Fokker Planck equations is. Uh, it instantiates this kind of renormalization group flow. That there's a particular uh, uh, there's particular kernels, these C kernels, which govern, for example, the Fokker Planck. So this is like an infinite dimensional version of a Fokker Planck equation because th this is the two derivative term and this is like this is the, the gradient term. And that th this 
with, with this particular way of distributing these kernels C, which are related to our cutoff function, uh, this will make it so that um, we preserve all the physics below some scale lambda. So just to, to analogize it, so this is the usual Fokker Planck equation, and time here is going to be related to the log of our initial scale to the scale that we're changing by. So this, this is the analogy. Now there's a more general set of equations due to Wegener and Morris. There's like a slightly more general form of the kernels that can be a little bit richer uh, that that look more like the fact that uh, allow kind of the flexibility of the choice of this V of X. The details are not so important, but essentially over the intervening years since Polchinski's work in the 90s and actually it was more fully developed only about 20 years ago, there's a more general set of solutions. So Polchinski ons off the particular solution to the equations. There's a whole infinitude and they're characterized by a much broader family of Fokker plot equations, it turns out. Okay, so let me now make a few comments about optimal transport, and then we'll tie everything together. Okay, so let me maybe write it out like this. Suppose we consider an infinite dimensional version of optimal transport. We have two probability distributions, P1 phi and P2 phi, over the space of fields, and we have some transport curl. And the transport kernel has the feature that when you marginalize one of the fields or the other, you get P1 or P2 respectively. Moreover, we have some cost function from the space of fields across the space of fields to the real numbers. So this is the Kantorovich formulation of the optimal transport problem, but on the space of fields. We're going to be interested in a kind of uh, Wasserstein two distance, um, which, which looks like this, uh, where this kernel B is a kernel. So here I've written it in, in position space. Let me write it in Fourier space. In Fourier space, this is a kernel which is localized at momentum scale that are at the cutoff scale. So when we look at its inverse, what's going on in the Wasserstein 2 distance is that it penalizes you for changing the data of the fields anywhere that's away from the cutoff scale. So in other words, you're only kind of low cost, if you will, if you are rearranging degrees of freedom, which are at the, right at the scale lambda. So it's interesting. So I'm going to uh -oh, so plug in my laptop. What's interesting is that if you, um, what's interesting is that if you, moment. Well, So let me cut to the chase. If this is the distribution that you want to flow, it turns out that if you specify some background distribution, which is fixed and is of your choice, and you define the relative entropy on the space of fields to be as thus, then the wegener morris equations, the most general solutions to Polchinski's problem, uh, take, take, the, take this form as a, as a gradient flow with respect to the wacker schein distance. This may not be, in a certain sense, terribly surprising for people who work in optimal transport theory, because due to the work of Otto, there's these beautiful connections between uh, gradient flows of entropies and heat equations. What I suggest to you is quite interesting, is that all of the known equations for renormalization group flow can be packaged into this form. This is this result by myself and Seth Simon, where um, Q is a choice of fiducial distribution, which in turns out parameterizes the space of ways you can do RG flow. But all of them, all of the Vector Morris equations, the more, most general solution to his problem, fall into this form. Sorry, what's the difference? The only difference between the P and the Q is a factor of two and a half. So ah, the yeah. two is conventional. Yeah. And it, it's to say that this is not an equation which evolves under the flow. This is something that you get to choose. Uh, it, it's, it's an ambiguity. Where's it goes? You could choose it to be a Gaussian, for example, if you like. That's the nicest case. But but in others, in, in more generally, people in physics have studied it using non-Gaussians. But um, it turns out that in renormalization group, we have a terminology in which we say this is a choice of scheme. There's a, a way that we do the coarse training, and it's specified by this fiducial background distribution. And the claim is that all of the known RG flow schemes can be packed in precisely this way. That's that, that's sort of the claim about the solutions to the Wegener morris problem, that it's that this is precisely the way you can recast what they what they discovered. So in the interest of time, let me um, 
make a few more comments and then I can conclude. So because of the fact that the vector morris flow equation, it has this optimal transport picture, but it also has this Fokker-Planck interpretation, it makes sense that it should have both pictures because those two pictures are often related to one another. But if it has a Fokker-Planck picture, then you can consider a stochastic Langevin version. And you can play the same game that we did before, where if you want to now sample along an RG flow, you can solve a certain stochastic Langevin PDE, which tells you how fields evolve. And now that allows you to give you a stochastic PDE, which allows you to compute RG flows. This was not known before. So the, the leaps of logic here was that we first realized that renormalization group flow is a stochastic Langevin, sorry, is a Fokker Planck equation. This was not known before, before Simone and I thought about it a bit. And then once you know that, you can refine the stochastic Langevin equation to which it corresponds. And now you get a way of actually uh, implementing this on a computer, for example, on the lattice. So another way of saying it is that one might be dubious for, for mathematical point of view that this equation really even makes sense, these functional derivatives, these infinite dimensional distributions, but this is a completely well-defined stochastic PD. And you can use this if you wish as the definition of what you mean by RG flows. Um, and this now opens, opens, the, feet, opens the, the, the question to being able to study it rigorously, because you can study this object rigorously. This one, I have no idea how to do. So that's, that, that's one of the key takeaways. So, yes. Could you just ask that? So, uh, so for your plan, the for your plan equation can be interpreted uh, in an optimal transport terms. That's yes. The, that's one of the main results. So, uh, once you know this, then you can interpret the stochastic version of that. Is this what you're saying? Or... Yeah, so there's different routes. Uh, I mean, how do I say? The way that we were led to it historically was that we discovered the optimal transport formulation first. And then that meant for the Fokker Planck equation for, for a renormalization group flow. And then we realized that that meant that it should be articulate, it was the same as a Fokker Planck equation, which then led us to stochastic logic. But there are different formulations that make it useful for proving different kinds of statements. But to us at the moment, the most current version of the statement is the stochastic logic. Mm -hmm. This is the latest version of it. And this is actually the easiest formulation to work with because this is just a stochastic PDE that if I didn't tell you where it com came from, would have various natural properties and you can study it. But what's interesting is that it corresponds to this sort of infinite, this sort of functional problem, which is much more murky and complex, but it, but, but you know, formally these things capture the same data. But I was just wondering about Fokker Planck equation, uh, its optimal transport version is known for, uh, not, not, not version, but uh, interpretation. Yes. Uh, well, we, in the case of renormalization group flow, we, we, we gave it as this relevant. Yeah. But without this renormalization group, just for your plan, is it well known? Or I, I, I just don't, I, I'm not uh, I, I suspect, I, I, I haven't seen this, rel this relative entropy formula that we wrote down also works in finite dimensions. I suspect that it's known to people who know. It. And thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Okay. So let me um, just show you some pictures and, and, and conclude because uh, we're running out of time. But the, the, the basic idea now is that, so for mathematicians, the takeaway is, okay, here's some set of equations that you can use to study renormalization group flow that's stochastic PDEs. We've reduced it to sort of a problem that is now mathematically precise and rigorous. So that's, that's a useful formulation. If you do algorithms, you might say, ah, well, now we can think about numerically computing renormalization group flows. Maybe we can even use these latent diffusion models to learn features of quantum field theories and, uh, and, and to do sampling from these distributions. So let me just show you just some data and then I'll conclude. We essentially use this in a more recent paper. We combined the ideas that I told you, these stochastic Langevin type equations, uh, these stochastic Langevin PDEs for renormalization group flow with these ideas from latent diffusion models, like to produce these images which allowed us to, uh, to, to learn essentially how parameters of statistical field theories change along RG flows. So what we can do is that we can compute in the blue curve how some parameter of some statistical model of a magnet, for example, changes along an RG flow. Uh, and then in red is some approximate version of the model that we get by latent diffusion models, which is extremely numerically efficient to compute, and it agrees with the answer very closely. And then the green curve is some other model that people were using by comparison. So we find, at least in these preliminary numerics, that the exact RG flow is very close to the learned RG flow, which is learned by these latent diffusion models, which makes the sampling problem algorithmically a lot easier in practice. 
So this is some kind of practical method. Um, yeah. So when you say exact RG flow, so these are for exactly small small models, or where did they? Ah, uh, so by exact RG flow, I mean that you solve, you, you just evolve according to the stochastic PD. But what I'm saying is that you can learn a good approximation to that stochastic PDE using these latent diffusion models. That's right. Okay, so there's various connections to other stories, which we can talk about later, but let me conclude here. So there's many rich connections between field theory and latent diffusion models and also with stochastic Langevin model equations. And what we've given is new algorithms for efficiently sampling field theories, uh, as well as sampling along RG flows we also talk about sampling ground states and quantum field theories in the paper. And the idea is that on the one hand, from the machine learning point of view, these RG flow ideas actually can help improve features of latent diffusion models for image generation. So there's practical applications of this because once you realize that the equations used for latent diffusion models are related to the statistical physics problems, you can leverage roughly 50 years of insights in physics about the structure of these equations how coarse graining works in cases of magnets or statistical systems to then help improve the image models. Um, but I think that at least from a mathematical point of view, the thing I wanted to emphasize again is that we give now a stochastic PDE, which allows you to touch a, a non-perturbative formulation of renormalization curve flow, which is amenable to mathematical study, whereas all of the previous formulations were not amenable because they were these functional versions, which were not really well-defined. So that's what I would say is the takeaway. And with that, thank you so much for your attention.